Uh, sorry for the delay. <laughs> uh, my name's uh, Lauren um, from the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung and welcome to the next panel of our conference, Rosa Luxemburg at 150, Revisiting Her Radical Life and Legacy. Uh, this panel is on the topic of Rosa Luxemburg and feminism. And with that, I will hand it over to the chair, Peter Hudis. Uh, thank you very much, Lauren. And um, thank you all for attending this uh, very important session. Um, I'm standing in for uh, Sandra Rain, who was originally supposed to uh, chair this session, but Sandra unfortunately is dealing with a serious family emergency. So she asked me on rather short notice to stand in for her. Um, but we'll have two uh, very outstanding speakers today on this panel who have done a lot of work on the issue of Marxism and feminism and including the relationship uh, between both and the work of Rosa Luxemburg. Uh, so we will have uh, Antica Kadacic uh, from Zag University of um, uh, uh, Zagreb in Croatia. Uh, she's written a number of uh, works on Luxembourg and feminism uh, that are of um, considerable uh, significance, especially I recommend her recent work, Like a Clap of Thunder, Three Essays on Rosa Luxemburg. Uh, she's also author of Spectre of Transitions, A Social History of Capitalism. Uh, she'll be going first. Each speaker will get 25 minutes um, for uh, their comments, and then we'll have hopefully a good 40 minutes or so for 35, 40 minutes for discussion. And we certainly hope for as much back and forth and discussion as possible. Uh, after Ankitsch speaks, we'll hear from uh, Frigga Haug, who is an extremely well-known and outstanding, and for many of us, very influential uh, philosopher and sociologist, who is an extremely prolific writer and continues to be on issues of feminism and Marxism and social movements for liberation. And um, so we're very honored to have both of these uh, uh, women on our panel today to be able to uh, bring to light and to continue a discussion of, of an issue that's become of greater importance in Luxembourg scholarship, but also in political activism and debates about the future of socialism and the Marxist movement, the relationship of Lawrence Luxembourg's feminist dimension to contemporary politics. And of course, debates on the extent to which there is a feminist dimension of Luxembourg or the extent to which that is relevant to contemporary politics opens up all sorts of important issues that I'm sure we'll be having a chance to further explore uh, on this panel. So with that, um, Ankacha is going to be uh, speaking on what is Luxembourgian feminism. So I'll turn it over to her. Um, thank you. Thank you, Peter, for the lovely um, introduction. Uh, I have to say, and I share my thoughts with you, I'm really thrilled to, to share this panel with Riga Haug, who I uh, really follow during many years and find her work really inspiring and motivating. Um, so yes, as uh, Peter already mentioned, the title uh, of my today's presentation is What is Luxembourgian Feminism? So what I will try to do with this presentation is to make a short and modest contribution to feminist analyses that are based on Rosa Luxemburg's critique of political economy and her understanding of capital accumulation, but also a contribution to a contemporary social reproduction theory which aims to integrate Luxembourg's legacy alongside that of Marx by combining Luxembourg's theory of accumulation and social reproduction theory, I will try to offer an introduction to concept I termed Luxembourgian feminism. It should be, however, absolutely clear, and I cannot stress this enough, that uh, Luxembourg was a Marxist feminist as we use the term today. Um, even though Rosa Luxembourg enjoys great sympathy amongst feminists, it should be noted that feminist interpretations of Luxembourg's theories in general are rare. Even rarer are feminist engagements with her, the accumulation of capital. If there is any interest in feminist interpretation of Luxembourg's work, it is usually defined in relation to her personal life and occasionally to her theory. Luxembourg not having written much on the subject of the woman question certainly contributed to the fact that the subject of most interpretations of Luxembourg's feminism is linked to episodes from her life and intimacy. And these are naturally enough, highly important subjects, particularly bearing in mind 
that historical scholarship has traditionally avoided women and their experiences. However, here I'm aiming to step away from that sort of interpretation in order to contribute to a socially production feminism based on Luxembourg's texts on women and her critique of political economy. Even though Luxembourg did not write many texts on the so-called woman question, that does not mean that her work should be omitted from a feminist revolutionary history. On the contrary, it would be highly inaccurate to claim that her works, and specifically her critique of political economy, lack numerous reference points for the development of progressive feminist policy and female emancipation throughout history and today. With Luxembourg's deaccumulation of capital in mind and her strong emphasis on the vibrant dynamics between capitalist and non-capitalist space, let us try to take Luxembourg's theory a step further. Is it possible to establish a connection between the Luxembourgian dialectics of spatiality and social reproduction theory? Can the framework of the Luxembourgian um, uh, critique of political economy be used for the feminist analysis of women's reproductive work and its economic role in the reproduction of accumulation. Although it may seem that both frameworks function as independent analytical elements, the contemporary methods of capital accumulation and women's reproductive labor are two united, interconnected processes. In this presentation, the above questions shall be analyzed in two parts. Firstly, I will offer a short presentation of Luxembourg's critique of bourgeois feminism. And secondly, um, I will try to offer the reading of the accumulation of capital through the social reproduction theory. On the eve of the World War I, after about 15 years of preparation, Rosa Luxembourg published The Accumulation of Capital, a contribution to an economic explanation of imperialism in Berlin 1913. Her most comprehensive theoretical work and one of the most relevant and original classical works of Marxist economics. Briefly put, The Accumulation of Capital sought a way to scientifically study and explain the conditions of capitalist monopolization, extended reproduction and imperialism, while taking into account the dynamic relation between capitalist and non-capitalist spatiality. With this book, she somehow realized that Marx theories are not the last word, but should be treated as great inspiration. Luxembourg held that Marx had neglected capitalist spatial determination while in his critique of capital, he had centered exclusively on time, i.e. the temporal dimension of the internal dynamics of capitalist reproduction. In contrast, Luxembourg sought to show that capitalist inner core consists of the drive to consume what is external to it, non-capitalist strata. Luxembourg's goal was to articulate her own theory of extended reproduction and critique of classical economics, which would contain not only a temporal, but also a spatial analytical dimension. This spatial determination of capitalist accumulation, the relation between capitalist and non-capitalist strata, Peter Hudis has named dialectics of spatiality. The moment the accumulation of capital appeared, friend, friends and enemies alike piled sharp criticism upon Luxembourg. She collected all the critics and immediately replied in her anti-critique, stressing how no other Marxist book received such harsh reviews as her accumulation. She wrote, quote, such a fate has befallen no other party publication, as far as I know, and over the decades, social democratic publishers have certainly not produced all gold and pearls. All these events clearly indicate that in one way or another, there have been passions at work other than those of pure science." End of quote. Even Lenin stated that she distorted Marx and her work was interpreted as a, vision, as a vision of Marx in spite of the fact that it was Luxembourg who mounted a vehement attack on the revisionist tendencies within the German SPD. 
although the accumulation of capital was met with severe criticism upon publication, it was not only her work that was criticized as ostensibly suspect in its Marxism. These critics often used cheap psychological and conservative naturalizing arguments that were meant to undermine the credibility of Luxembourg's work and expose it as an inept and insufficiently acquainted with Marxist texts. A good example of this type of criticism is provided by Werner Zombat, who stated in his Der Proletarische Sozialismus, quote, the angriest socialists are those who are burdened with the strongest resentment. This is typical. The bloodthirsty poisonous soul of Rosa Luxemburg has been burdened with a quadruple resentment as a woman, as a foreigner, as a Jew, and as a cripple." End of quote. Even within the German Communist Party, she was dubbed the syphilis of the Comintern, and Max Weber once assessed Rosa Luxemburg as somebody that belongs in a zoo. Raya Dunayevskaya, in her book, cites a part of a letter in which Viktor Adler writes to August Bebel on the subject of Luxemburg. Quote, the poisonous bitch will yet do a lot of damage, all the more so because she is as clever as monkey, while on the other hand, her sense of responsibility is totally lacking and her only motive is an almost pervasive desire for self-justification." End of quote. In question was evidently a certain type of conservative political behavior that amounted to attacking prominent women, which in this case included a serious sexist dismissal of Luxembourg's work. Luxembourg was well aware of a suffocating sexism that pervaded not only society as a whole, but also the rank and file of social democratic movement. In 1902, she wrote, in social democracy, political and social life as well, a strong, fresh wind would blow in with the political emancipation of women, which would clear out the suffocating air of the current Philistine family life that rubs itself so unmistakably, even on our party members, workers and leaders alike. End of quote. Luxembourg did not exclusively devote herself to organizing female worker groups. Her work in that field was obscured by the fact that she usually worked behind the scenes. She fervently supported the organizational work of the socialist women's movement, understanding the importance and difficulties of work life for female emancipation. She usually showed her support through cooperation with her close friend, Clara Zetkin. Besides working behind the scenes, she still engaged herself in an open discussion concerning the class problem faced by the women's movement. While speaking about Luxembourg's work on woman question, we are actually restricting ourselves to the several known texts and speeches from 1902 to 1914. Russian women workers in battle, a tactical question addressed to the International Socialist Women Conference, women's suffrage and class struggle, and the proletarian woman. In women's, in women's suffrage and class struggle, Luxembourg criticized bourgeois feminism and certainly pointed out, quote, if it were a matter of bourgeois ladies voting, the capitalist state could expect nothing but effective support for the reaction. Most of those bourgeois women who act like lionesses in the struggle against male prerogatives would trot like docile lambs in the camp of conservative and clerical reaction if they had suffrage, end of quote. For Rosa Luxemburg, the question of women's suffrage is a tactical one as it formalizes in her own words an already established political maturity of proletarian women. For Luxembourg, liberal rights do not arise as a reflection of actual material social conditions. They are merely set up as abstract and nominal, thus rendering their actual implementation or application impossible, as she contemptuously argued. These rights are merely formalistic rubbish that has been carted out and parroted so often that it no longer retains any practical meaning." End the quote. 
In Luxembourg's opinion, the role of bourgeois women is very important for the reproduction of the capital as a whole because it maintains an active presence in perpetuating the established social relations, she writes. Bourgeois women are parasites of the parasites of the social body and co-consumers are even are usually even more rabid and cruel in defending their right to a parasite's life than the direct agents of class rule and exploitation." End of quote. Luxembourg was not alone in her sharp criticism of bourgeois feminism. Clara Zetkin, Nadezhda Krupskaya, and Alexandra Kolontai, among others, contributed a great deal, particularly if we bear in mind their standpoint towards the reactionary attitudes of liberal women on the emancipation of women. Considering the problem of female labor force, socialist women pointed out that workload of women is additionally aggravated by reproductive labor within the household sphere. But to what are we actually referring to while speaking about reproductive labor in the context of the social reproduction theory. Historically, the reproduction of the working class is undertaken by women outside the productive sphere and is unpaid. It essentially refers to three interconnected processes. First, the regeneration of workers and their livelihood. Second, the maintenance of non-workers, which relates to the care of children, the elderly and the unemployed in general. And third, childbirth as the reproduction of new labor force. This indicates the ontological level of the problem, activities not defined as labor, food preparation, cleaning, care, breastfeeding, giving birth, and lacking any market value are not considered labor. The aims of social reproduction theory are to analyze phenomena that are hidden in the production process to inquire into the mode of process that enables the worker to attend their work, to investigate the conditions of the worker's existence and to examine the social processes that relate to these conditions. All these questions were absolutely clear to Luxembourg. For an example, in a speech from 1912, she differentiated between labor in the market sphere and the labor in the household sphere, thereby laying the foundations for what I would like to call the early social reproduction theory. And allow me to read a longer quote. This kind of work, bringing up children or housework, is not productive in the sense of the present capitalist economy, no matter how enormous an achievement the sacrifices and energy spent the thousand little efforts add up to as long as capitalism and the wage system rule, only that kind of work is considered productive, which produces surplus value, which creates capitalist profit. From this point of view, the music hall dancer, whose legs sweep profit into her employer's pocket is a productive worker, whereas all the toil of the proletarian women and mothers in the four walls of their homes is considered unproductive. This sounds brutal and insane, but corresponds exactly to the brutality and insanity of our present capitalist economy and seeing this brutal reality clearly and sharply is the proletarian women's first task." End of quote. Following this quote, let us try to propose several key features of so-called Luxembourgian feminism. The crucial question which leads us toward that goal is, what is the connection point between Luxembourg's theory of accumulation and social reproduction theory? And the short answer is the commodification of domestic labor. Only when a large part of the population is dispossessed and forced to sell its labor power on the market, including the female workforce, it is possible to talk about the systematic processes of capital accumulation. Exactly in this line of understanding, in her accumulation of capital, Luxembourg quotes Marx. The laboring population can increase when previously unproductive workers are transformed into productive ones 
or sections of the population who did not work previously, such as women and children or paupers, are drawn into the production process. The market, in order to accumulate capital, is maintained by spreading to non-capitalist spaces, integrating into the productive sphere populations which were not traditionally part of the market. Domestic labor is not a productive part of the market and can, for the purposes of this discussion, be treated as an external element of the capitalist economy. It does not have a value or a price and ontologically does not have the status of labor. The commodification of domestic labor could, in the Luxembourgian framework, be viewed as a typical example of the expansion of capitalism into a non-capitalist field. From the early 1970s onwards, social welfare was increased through the inclusion of household in market circulation. A whole variety of economic activities were concentrated around domestic work, care, and similar services previously offered in a non-capitalist manner. The neoliberalization of the market through the introduction of part-time labor contracts, the flexibilization of the workforce, and the deregulation of labor and welfare legislations are all phenomena related to the 1970s crisis and stagflation when the neoliberalization of society was being formalized in part through women's labor and the commodification of domestic work. Female migrant labor is certainly one such example of the commodification of domestic labor, which illustrates how traditionally not a constitutive element of the productive sphere became integrated into market circulation useful for carrying out reproductive labor. Since the late 80s, European women have entered the paid labor force en masse, albeit at different paces and in different forms in each country, the majority of working aged women are now in some form of employment outside a household, as discussed by Sarah Ferris in her book, In the Name of Women's Rights. Furthermore, the immigrant population is no longer predominantly male. On the contrary, in some European countries, women constitute the majority of migrants. The demand for carriers, cleaners, child and elderly minders, or social reproduc producers in general, has grown so much in the last 30 years that it is now regarded as a phenomenon brought about by the global crisis of social reproduction, as well as the main reason for the feminization of migration. For the mid 1990s onward, this trend is even more present and following on from the European directive and seeking to secure the resources provided by the integration funds. Since 2007, a number of programs have been adopted to mobilize the female workforce, including non-EU, non-Western migrant women in the national labor market. Given that today half of the world's migrant population consists of women, we may confidentially speak about the phenomena of feminization of migration. Within the framework of accumulation processes, or more concretely imperialism in Luxembourg's terms, female migrant work, a cheap and precarious labor force, becomes the ideal force for the reproduction of capitalism. What is important to notice here is that when the production suffers the crisis, reproductions suffer the same. In order to make things work and to maintain regular reproduction, the state outsources its social roles to families and more precisely to women. During the current COVID crisis, we are witnessing this phenomena even stronger. Reproductive labor is essential work that our economy tends not to acknowledge or compensate. What we are witnessing today is the possibility that the dangers of devaluing domestic labor could eventually materialize into a crisis too big to ignore. The concept of social reproduction contributes to the analysis of capitalism in its totality because it integrates both market and non-market aspects of capitalism. It should be noted that 
despite the fact that migrant women were integrated into the productive sphere through the market, their appearance on the international labor market in no way constitutes competition for the male working class. This is because they mainly participate in a work sector connected to reproductive labor. On the one hand, Western upper class women have attained emancipation and have thus outsourced their domestic work to migrant women. But on the other, by outsourcing that labor, they treat migrant women whose labor they buy as they might any commodity on the market. It seems history repeats itself through the paradox of bourgeois feminism. Once again, we have a situation where one class of women exploits the other, where the emancipation grasps only the upper class women and excludes women's working class, exactly as Luxembourg described it in her critique of bourgeois feminism. Con contemporary critique of political economy should broach the phenomena of female migrant labor as it enables us to understand how the crisis of social reproduction functions and the ways in which modern day trends of accumulation are being realized using the relations of, as Luxembourg puts it, the capitalist and non-capitalist worlds. Since I have argued that feminist interpretations of Luxembourg's theory are rare, this presentation tried to fill the gap and thus functioned as an introduction to a concept I termed Luxembourgian feminism based on the link between Luxembourg's theory of accumulation and social reproduction theory. As capitalism successfully exploits gender for the purposes of the class interests of capital, we are facing an important task of designing anti-capitalist strategies based on the resistance uh, to the market and its reproduction, thereupon focusing simultaneously, unitarily on the domestic sphere and reproductive processes within the framework of the capitalist mode of production, at a time when systematic analysis of the relation between the market and the state, either on the national or international level, are necessary starting points for a discussion of any short or long-term alternatives to the capitalist mode of production, Luxembourg's dialectics of spatiality and her connection to social reproduction theory, especially in the terms of migrant labor, seem to present not only a valuable introductory reference, but also the political model, well suited to organizing alliances among parallel structures and aligning their progressive goals. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you very much, Ankitsha, for a wonderful presentation that was exactly 25 minutes uh, and uh, has a lot of ideas in there, I'm sure, for people to uh, take out uh, and discuss um, in the discussion. I think we'll take our next speaker uh, and then we'll take questions on both talks at the same time. Does that sound okay to everybody? Um, so I'm very honored uh, to uh, present uh, Frigga Haug as our, our second speaker. Uh, Frigga is somebody that many of us have been reading and studying and thinking about for many decades. She's a path-breaking uh, figure in the German left, in the feminist movement, in Marxism, and has done an enormous amount to keep uh, alive the ideas of Rosa Luxemburg in general, but in particular uh, also uh, the debates on feminism today and its importance for the reconstruction of a viable Marxism. So I'm very, very proud to be able to turn the floor over uh, to Frigga Haug, uh, who is going to uh, talk to us on how to use Luxembourg's thoughts for feminist politics. I think you're still muted, Frigga. So you need to unmute. Okay, I did it with my fingers. <laughs> it's okay now. Perfect. Yes. Thank you. Can we can we get Ankika's Ankika's talk in a written form? Can could you mail it, please? Because I had so many difficulties with only one ear to get the whole context. So most of the time I thought, yes, exactly, that's what I want to say. And then I didn't know whether you didn't mean it in the other way around. So 
please I'm send sure. it. Yes, I will send it. Okay, and now wh why did you don't take it off? Okay. Ah, it's fine. No, okay. So thank you very much for the invitation and for being able to talk here with handicaps all over, like Luxembourg. <laughs> so I start somewhat earlier the reception of Luxembourg until the 80s of last centuries was either hostile, ignorant, or romantic that she loved flowers and animals and relating to her martyrdom for being killed and drowned in the channel. Even in handbooks in the tradition of the workers' movement and its history, historiography, you could learn that Rosa Luxemburg had, has not contributed anything theoretical worth mentioning, and overall she overestimated the masses. In this atmosphere, I did not add Luxembourg to my list of books to read and study, not earlier than the 1980s, which was really late, when I had to find some texts for a feminist seminar organized by female students in protest to the male-dominated university seminars. So I had to find a woman. And there were the efforts in bourgeois papers of describing her as bloody, passionately defending revolutionary violence or just waffling her to a nobody. I give you an example published in the most important bourgeois daily FATS, Frankfurt General News, newspaper, written as late as 1988 by somebody who had written a book on Luxembourg in 1970. The text is so reactionary patriarchal that it can still be used as wonderful material for discourse analysis. I quote him because I come with this quote back to Luxembourg soon. He, sh he wrote, Luxembourg had a girlishly merry nature. She was bodily handicapped. She introduced herself as youthful starlet in the Social Democratic Party, told comely sounding things and lofty platitudes, and finally fell for the seduction by Marx. They're finding intellectual fulfillment. That's wonderful to take into pieces. The letter judgment I read as a promise, which inspired my forthcoming intensive study of as many of her writings that were translated or originally written in Germany, in German. Most of them written for newspapers and then the elaborated ones like Kreisel crisis of social democracy and the accumulation of capital, which rendered me into her follower more and more enthusiastic, having never before read a theorist who had understood Marx's ideas and theory in such a perfect and lively way. She wrote as if Marx had been inside her. The climate around Luxembourg had already shine, changed. for many. In the late 80s by Magdalena Trotta's highly emotional movie in favor of Rosa. This was in 1986. I went to see it with the whole seminar of my students. But though this film made most of them fall in love with her, it mediated nothing about her theoretical ideas, her Marxism. In this respect, it could have been a silent film. It is certainly no short way to learn enough of her political ideas. So I will give a short introduction into her political theory, which grounded her politics. Since you learned to know Rosa Luxemburg from the first quote from this bourgeois daily, I give you an example of her own style of writing in the political field as a contrast and different introduction into her as a political author by quoting one of her very few, very few descriptions of the fate of women to compare this with the former judgment of her juvenile platitudes. 
Do you pronounce it platitudes? <laughs> now, Luxembourg. The workshop of the future needs many hands and an ardent breath. A world of female misery waits for salvation. There is the groaning wife of the peasant almost breaking down under the burden of life. There, in German Africa, in the desert of Kalahari, bleach the bones of the defenseless women of the Herreros who were chased into the cruel death of hunger and thirst by the German marauding soldiery. On the other side of the ocean, in the high rocks of the Putamayo, the death screams of tortured Indian women in the rubber plantations of international capitalists go unheard. Proletarian women, poorest of the poor, most lawless of the lawless, rush to the fight for the liberation of the female sex and the humankind from the horror of capitalist domination. In contradistinction to the legend about her, I learned to know her as a theorist who is analytically strong and prospective, innovative and indispensable. She te teaches us the importance of self-criticism and the danger of bureaucrat bureaucratization. I'm not born a non-native English speaker. You did it perfectly. <laughs> bureaucratization of politics as the greatest danger. Mark's way of thinking to see the crisis and contradictions as possibility of development is adopted and carried forward by her. She uses elements from the context of the communist manifest and of the catastrophe of war. See, for example, the short text Debris. Very short, but each war does not only destroy physical goods, not only material cultural values, it is simultaneously an unrespectful rebel against established concepts, old sanctuaries, worshipped institutions, believingly repeated formulas are thrown onto the same rubble heap by an iron broom on which the remnants of the cannons shot to pieces, guns, knapsacks, and other waste of war are deposited. In very short, accurate wording, she formulates a world of insights and offers them like old wisdoms, wisdoms which everybody can understand. For example, we think the following sentence. For the bourgeois woman, her home is her world. For the proletarian, the world is her home. And you can easily continue the consequence that the new task for women grows into making the whole world livable, livable and homely. For feminist politics, think of a concept of revolutionary real politics, a term coined by her within which she pulls two opposites together, reform and revolution, which allows for criticizing social democratic activists who only concentrate on improving the conditions of life for workers as mere reformism on the one hand, and simultaneously those who only fight for revolution in the name of another society as revolutionarism, while she proposes a different politics. She introduces it in her essay on the 20th anniversary of Marx's death in 1903 as a rupture with politics so far, and as a passionate Marxist, she gives her own politics this name. She shows that those who fight for better conditions of life make themselves the speakers for the workers, develop an apparatus, and ossify in bureaucratic structures, and in the long run defend a politics of preserving prosperity, and thus make themselves safeguards of the existing social, existing social relations. But these are capitalist ones and with its goals of growth and profit in themselves revolutionary, as Marx has carefully analyzed. They hurry the development of the productive forces along. All that is what is stationary and solid vaporizes. Nothing remains as it is. The mode of living, morals, virtues, values, the plans for family, profession, security, and possible future are constant, constantly turned inside out. 
In its structures, society tumbles from crisis to crisis, covers the whole world with wars in search for raw material and markets for sale, thereby transforming non-capitalist modes of production for their own existence into capitalist ones, which um, Ankika already spoke about it. We, we call it now land grab. Formerly we called it colonization, but it's more modern to call it land grabbing, Landnahme. The critique of these processes in Luxembourg's approach is necessary as enlightenment. But this is not enough. A vision is also necessary as a utopia, a perspective which transcends the capitalist society. From there, the relevance of all actual politics, what she calls short-term objectives, have to be determined from a point which she calls long-term goal. Socialist politics, which do not start with the conditions of life of the working, omit the position of the working class in an utopian enthusiasm. The socialist perspective remains a pure illusion, a mere picture of clouds, which might explain the different tendencies in the left, but cannot embed them in the working class herself. Luxembourg regards the revolutionary dimension only as a preliminary stage of the action which finally enables the proletariat for the complete revolution of the old relations and the construction of a socialist society. Follows, socialist politics needs the fight for the conditions of life as well as the perspective of an alternative society. The crucial point for Luxembourg is the how of the connection between real politics and revolutionary perspective. I quote her, without general elections, unrestricted freedom of the press and freedom of assembly and open debate, life in every public institution dies and turns into a semblance of life in which the bureaucracy alone remains the active element. The themes grow into each other. Criticism of mistakes, self-criticism, critical knowledge, culture, learning from experience. These are at the same time the foundation of Luxembourg's thinking. After the failure of social democracy with the endorsement of war credits in 1914, in 1917, she calls for the formation of a new party. Now it is however clear for every thinking worker that a rebirth of the workers' movement from its present collapsed state and its present disgrace is impossible if one is not clear about the causes that the scandal of the 4th of August 1914 actually had its roots in the nature of the workers' movement before. From this follows that the starting point, the first step, for creating a new socialist movement in Germany has to be a thorough radical confrontation with the past. It is only from the source of self-criticism, a merciless thorough examination of one's own mistakes in program, tactics and organization that one can obtain clear guidelines for the future. It is necessary to take up a political examination of the main features in the praxis of German social democracy and the trade unions unearth their main shortcomings in the past. For Luxembourg, the main mistake is the paralysis through passivating bureaucracy as a threat to democracy. So Luxembourg writes, only experience is cap capable of correcting and opening up new paths. Only unrestrained, bubbling life strikes a thousand new forms, improvisations, gains, creative strengths, corrects all mistakes on its own. Otherwise, socialism would be decreed and imposed from the green table of a dozen intellectuals. A new society, points out Luxembourg, cannot be reconstructed according to the old recipes 
it needs the experiment. It is one such experiment. Luxembourg calls for writing also history as a work of common people. The entire human culture is a work of social interaction of many. It is the work of the masses. This history of mankind teems with sagas, great deeds of great men. It echoes the fame of fame of wise kings, brave generals, daring, discovering travelers, genial, genial interventors and heroic liberators. At first glance, all good and bad, the fortune as well as the misery of the masses is the work of individual rulers of great men. In reality, it is the people, the nameless masses themselves, who create their own destiny, their happiness, and their woes. To summarize, her proposed praxis of socialist politics is enable the working to shape their society to rule it. From this point, you can decipher the connectedness of her political thinking and in consequence, the topics and emphasis she elaborates. It is politics from below, therefore determined by the idea that if that it is the working people themselves who have to take their society into their own hands. This starting point makes her the imperative, imperative affiliation for the new social movements and first of all, the feminist. She rethinks the Marxian heritage and states that it is much more than what the working class needs right now. For them, the first volume of capital would be enough. But in the whole, you must also study her critique of the Russian Revolution and her idea of the role of the party who is not supposed to give prescriptions, announce laws, but a party's task is to allow for common developments, for shaping societies, setting free critique, diversity, multiplicity, fantasy, and what she calls education or training means Organize experiments, allow learning by doing. And if you look at the Russian Revolution, which she enthusiastically welcomed in the beginning, but soon realized that it failed since the people were not included in the construction of the new society, so it could not be socialism at all. So an absolutely modern theoretical strategy is precisely the dissolution of conventional oppositions, the displacement of questions. For example, in the dispute over parliament, she lays the basic of a politics of contradictions. She regards parliament as historic form of the class domination of the bourgeoisie, which has to be utilized by the representatives of the working class in order to improve the social conditions of the working people, but more than that, to prevent its constant threat from the bourgeoisie and as a whole to show with all interventions that, it's, that a different social order is necessary. The contradiction in which socialist parliamentarians operate is that they have to fight on the one hand for its retention and on the other hand for its abolition. In this way, she comprehends politics as pedagogy, as process in which people must learn to take governance into their own hands. She fights for a politics that shows the masses the inadequacy of social reformat reformatory, reformatory mending and the necessity of socialist upheaval. The representatives of the workers' class, without denying their role, can enter the bourgeois government only in one case, in order to simultaneously empower themselves and convert it into a government of the prevailing workers' class. However, this in government in Luxembourg's view would mean operating the business of governance in such a manner that more and more of it can be transferred into the hands of the governed. As the social problem cannot be solved in the form of a capitalist society, but nonetheless the condition of the worker can be improved, the politics of the socialist members of parliament 
appears outwardly contradictory, although it can be coherent in itself. The problem defines the conflict with anarchism as well as with reformism and is therefore addressed by her again and again. The role of social democracy, it's a quote, in the bourgeois leg legislative body is burdened with inner contradictions right from the beginning. Participating in positive legislation with practical results wherever possible, and at the same time to validate the view of basic opposition to the capitalist state at every step. That is the difficult task of our parliamentarians in the general outline. But she develops at individual points how politics in contradictions can be made into a particular design of parliamentary action of our parliament members. That includes recognition of the public welfare deeds of capital and state along with simultaneous permanent exposure of trades, which the dominant domination of private property imposes on legislature. I can't pronounce judiciary, judiciary and administration. Examples are to fight for the development of transportation, but not for the railway policy of the capital state for uplift of public education, but not for its present day form. Luxembourg also sees the liaisons of the capital side that demand substantial accomplished services from the bloc of those in power. Here, wish lists are prepared for the state regarding economic legislation, transportation, railway traffic, and public services, all for the benefit and advantage of the capital. When capital needs it, rivers are contaminated by industrial effluence and parts of the city are transformed into stinking plague, plague tracks, types. However, when the organized capital power beckons, canals are built, railroads are laid, and fashionable residential districts are developed which bath in air, sun, and cheerful greenery. Even though the individual possible steps in parliamentary work seem very small and almost hair-splitting on the narrow ridge between sectarian negation and bourgeois parliamentarism, Luxembourg gives a wider compass for this work. Only the combined action of different forms of struggle constitutes socialist politics. She mentions mobilization on the street, general strike and press work in particular, in the sense that the attention of the workers' mass is repeatedly drawn to its own power and own action and does not consider parliamentary struggles as a central axis of political life. Luxembourg's politics thus simultaneously needs the perspective and the standpoint of criticism that goes beyond the prevailing society. Even though parliamentarism, parliament, parliamentarism, democracy, press freedom are not socialist objectives, but bourgeois rights, they remain essential conditions for struggle within these existing social relations. So I concluded the remarks and quotes regarding Rosa Luxemburg in the search for feminism showed two things. She doubtlessly was no feminist herself. The women question did not even interest her especially. Why then discuss her in the problem of feminism at all? After studying Rosa Luxemburg for a long time, I dare the following assumption. There are very few authors, male or female, who if talking or writing on human beings in general, they really write on men male ones. In bourgeois science and politics, usually women disappear from history in the form of generality. This is not the case concerning Rosa Luxemburg, since she relates to the experience of the working people. She succeeds in writing in this higher form of generality, which can render Marxism and Marxist thinking really alive and vibrant. Therefore, we can learn from her 
that the inclusion of women as humans cannot be a special additional subject in the critique of society and its theories, but demand of any knowledge and politics to really speak in general terms in standpoint and perspective. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Frigga, for really remarkable and moving comments on uh, Rosa Luxemburg's legacy. So the time is now for discussion. Uh, and we're looking forward to as much questions and back and forth as possible. We've had some start to come in on our chat function. So I'll read out a few that have come in. Um, and um, one is, uh, first of all, there is um, the question of what would a confrontation with the past of social democracy mean? And how can we ensure that these mistakes are not repeated? So it's, what would a confrontation with the past of social democracy mean for today? And how can the mistakes uh, made in that in the past not be repeated? Uh, Riga, would you like to start first, maybe? I didn't even understand this question. What can... Uh, the question is, uh, Frigga, I'm sorry. Um, what would a confrontation with the past of social democracy mean? And how can we ensure that the mistakes of social democracy in the past are not repeated today? <laughs> it's, it's, it's very long. You just have to always think, it, it's, is it really meant for all? Is it general? It, this is easy to see. You can always see that uh, there are some elites. Uh, there is, uh, it's, for example, Ankika has given lots of examples that you can liberate um, women by um, putting to, uh, getting migrant workers to do their housework. Mm -hmm. So this is obviously not in general. This is a solution for some to the misery of others. So this is not... So the, uh, I think it's quite easy to do if you look at the standpoint and you look at the perspective and you go back and see, is it for everybody? Is it for all? Then you are, then it's easy. Look at the politics, for example, our social democrats are proposing. Anke Chet, did you want to jump in here? Well, I would probably uh, second the opinion of uh, Friga. Um, I think that first of all, um, we need to uh, somehow uh, historically approach the question and, and to see what were the mistake that flows in historical terms uh, in order not to make this usual mistake by using the methods, using uh, the ideas, strategies that we uh, actually working on during the revolutionary times, but uh, not actually functioning today. So in order not to make a mistake uh, in terms of any progressive movement, I think is to carefully look out what is inclusivity in, in this framework. Is it, as uh, Frigga pointed out, uh, democratic enough? Um, what about the, the many others which were excluded historically in the terms of, of course, uh, always looking back and uh, trying to address the questions which were false. But this is a really hard question in terms of the, the historical fail, fail of, of social democracy, because today we are still holding up you know, uh, trying to reach its progressive goals, reach its uh, useful strategies but then again we are witnessing the, the total collapse of social democracy in Europe so it's a difficult question and I think I, I, I'm not capable of answering that shortly yes maybe just in in, in terms of wishful thinking. <laughs> Another question that has come in is uh, for both of our panelists is can you recommend a concise text or speech from Luxembourg that best represents her feminist social critique? Uh, because the questioner would like to read it in class with her literary studies uh, students in a section on intersectional feminism. So it's a question about recommending a concise text or speech from Luxembourg 
that best shows her feminism? Um, I, I think that this is really an easy question because unfortunately Rosa Luxemburg didn't write many texts on the woman question. So uh, we located uh, so far just five texts and I can uh, repeat again which are those. So Russian women workers in battle, a tactical question addressed to the International Socialist Women Conference, women's suffrage and class struggle, and the proletarian woman. My suggestion is definitely to start with the women's suffrage and class struggle. It's probably the most concise, uh, most sharp criticism of bourgeois feminism that really speaks to us today. And I could add that uh, four out of those five writings that have just been mentioned uh, are found in the Rosa Luxemburg Reader. Uh, we put in a section on it, on Luxemburg's writings on women. And the first piece, uh, A Russian Woman in Struggle, uh, is published in volume three of the complete works of Rosa Luxemburg that was published by Verso last year. Uh, that was uh, being translated from German, yes. That's right, that was translated from the German. Yes. And that's in the Gesammelte Becker. Uh, yes. But Mann's sex, I think. I think six point. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Then this very short one on the proletarian woman. It's yes. only one and a half pages and it's full of insights. It's very good for class, mm -hmm. word by word. Because, for example, I did it in a, in a class and we were sort of hostile because her image of the proletarian woman in singing in between washed washed things in the rocks and was in the middle of the war it all sounded so old-fashioned but then all of a sudden all of them stepped in and said no she is not talking about single women she's talking about the whole class and they they sort of developed out of one and a half pages the whole wealth of her analysis in this case. Do you know this text? It's one and a half page, easy to read. Yes. And it's really, it's really good because it sounds old fashioned in the beginning with these scarves on their heads and <laughs> singing in, in, among baby, baby wash and so on. But then it's, it's really, it's really astonishing in the inside of the different classes. This is the one where, which ends that uh, bourgeois woman has her home as her goal, oh. and by a proletarian has the whole world as her home. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, uh, there's a, a question for Ankitja. Uh, it's please tell us more about the connections between Luxembourgian feminism and your political theoretical aims and commitments in your book, Spectres of Transition. Well, that's, that's uh, an ongoing project. Uh, that's an interesting question. And, and, and thank you to the person who uh, actually posed it. Well, uh, the answer is uh, also a rather a short one. Uh, what I tr tried to do in my book on uh, spectres of transition was to analyze um, the transition from feudalism to capitalism. So my starting point is Marx, especially in terms of the so-called primitive accumulation of capital. But of course, there are many reference points in Rosa Luxemburg, especially when I discuss the problems of dispossession, the problems with the nature, the problem of the methods of colonialism and imperialism. And all those are ex uh, excellent starting points, I think, to uh, maybe envisage more the problems of transition from feudalism to capitalism, not just strictly in Marxist terms, but also in uh, Luxembourgian. And what I also try to do there is to offer a political Marxist approach to transition. But then again, even though at some point the accumulation of capital is um, especially at the end in, in, uh, in sketches, it still has many explanatory models in a way which explains how capitalism functions concretely in, in, in space, in spatial matter. And that's why I envisage uh, all the problems regarding uh, the land, uh, the dispossession of the, uh, 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 the expropriation uh, uh, of the land. And that were all the, 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 the starting points by connecting Luxembourg's theory of accumulation 
isolation on the one hand, and of course, Marxist, I would say, the political Marxist classical approach to the problem of transition from feudalism to capitalism. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have a question for Friga, um, which thanks you for the great paper and experiencing uh, uh, your biting the dragon that is doing Zoom. Uh, the question is, what is the source from Luxembourg concerning her position on uh, parliamentarianism? And since there is action nowadays in Israel, uh, what can be the correlation between activist grassroots politics and parliamentary politics? relationship between grassroots and parliamentary politics. Say the beginning sentence again. The relationship between... Between, uh, between uh, grassroots activism and parliamentary politics. What is the relationship between them? Mm -hmm. That's easy and, and difficult at the same time because the parliamentary, the parliament is obviously the bourgeois parliament with all the different position, one by the bourgeoisie against feudalism. So this all have to be kept because without them, nothing will be possible. So and now you now you have the left, or the proletarians are not on the on the stage. You have the left in parliament. So what are they going to do? They have this very difficult task to protect and defend parliament and parliamentary rules against its destruction by the bourgeois themselves. So, and, and in this way, they always defend a parliament which they obviously want to get rid of in the end. So that's a very contradictory position, but she, but she recommends that you just you must be clear about your own goals, about the perspective that, and the, the only solution I see to, to dissolve this contradiction, the only possibility is that you use this all the whole time to educate the people and the masses, to show, to enlighten, to develop new ideas about how it should be, could be, how to learn about it. And all the time, she's sort of idealistic. She thinks all the time, you could educate the masses to take government into their own hands by, by, um, by questioning it. You must develop alternative thinking at the same time. So you defend it against bourgeois rupture, or against the, the ideas of the bourgeoisie to get rid of parliament, because after having used it, used it to defeat feudalism, they don't need it any longer. They want to get rid of all its rules. So you have, as a leftist, have to defend it all the time. And you can see it every day in the, in the news. We could look at the news together and see what happens with, with the d different topics coming out up that you always have to defend the positions to which you got this far and don't think them they are the end. They are only steps. And the, the real end for her is that everybody learns to, to govern to see how to rule this society. Thank okay. you very much. Excellent. Uh, there was another question on parliamentary democracy from a friend from India who asked, how can parliamentary democracy, uh, how can we insert Rose's ideas into debates on parliamentary democracy, which I think you just addressed so well. Uh, Akacha, did you want to add anything to that or um, respond to the friend from India at all? 
it's it's really similar to the first question, but uh, I think that uh, we might underline once again that the questions of uh, democracy, um, education, social and workers' rights will definitely be something that we should look upon, uh, which seems quite you know, like, like a cliche when you say, oh, uh, we are fighting for workers and, and um, for workers' rights and, and their social and material rights, but I think that has to be inscribed both in formal politics and on some sub-political level. That's something that we're missing. And I think this is the, the exactly the point should be uh, inflicted in the, um, as the question asks, um, uh, in parliamentary, parliamentary democracy. But of course, as we know, uh, she was more up to um, um, uh, organization which is more on, on, on federal um, 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 levels and more direct. So if we want to have a, a politics in, in formal terms, I think Rosa Luxemburg would always insist we also have to have that on sub-political level in committees, in many different uh, uh, workers, parties, or for instance, in, in women's organization and so on. So democracy is not just something that is based for a uh, formal politics for parliamentary democracy, but also for something that works, I think, on sub political level. Thank you. Uh, but Peter, if I may interrupt, there was a yes. question from Kate Evans. Uh, ah. Okay. And it, it was, uh, I think it's a quite a concrete one, which somehow, okay. if I may answer to that, okay. um, it's, the, uh, it's an interesting question. And I found that quote in Bulaic, uh, he is a Yugoslav author. And I have to say that uh, we in Yugoslavia translated the accumulation of capital already in 50s and some of her letters uh, already in 20s. So uh, what I wanted to say is that it refers perfectly, I think, to the section that Dunayevskaya called a, a creeping, creeping phenomena in the revolutionary parties. It was a kind of dismissal of women who were not just politically active, but also on theoretical field and, and, and everything else. So yes, uh, actually the quote is from Wajj, and it, uh, I think, rings the bell quite uh, closely to that uh, of Max Weber, uh, who assessed there was a Luxembourg as somebody that belongs in a zoo, yes. Thank you very much. Okay, we do have another question that's an uh, interesting question has been posed, which is, um, uh, can we consider that the feminism of Luxembourg is not only in her writings, but also in the way she acted inside the international social democracy of her time as militant theoretician, propagandist, and journalist? As theoretician? As theoretician, just... propag uh, the question is, can we consider that the feminism of Luxembourg is found not only in her writings, but also in the way she acted inside the international workers' movement as a militant, as a theoretician, as a propagandist, as a journalist? Definitely, definitely. And I think that uh, traditional feminist engagements with Rosa Luxemburg were actually one of those. So when we celebrate Rosa Luxemburg today in feminist terms, I think that we're usually defining her as an, I don't know, a heroine or icon because she was brave, because she was uh, without compromise, because she was on the first line. But I think that uh, besides that point that we really explored many times, in not just in feminist terms, but generally speaking, I think that we also need a kind of theoretical approach in feminism, which suggests some starting points that are actually driven not just from the politics, but also political economy. So I think that uh, this is a valuable point, but beyond the uh, descriptions of somebody uh, as political everyday life, I think that the theory also speaks for itself. It's, it's somehow, it's somehow, um... Also, I agree with you, but then there is somehow something very general about her. She thinks she thinks a lot of the masses and she wants to bring them. For example, the bourgeois culture that they also can read all these wonderful uh, works <laughs> <laughs> and, and reform the schools and 
they, they don't have to work so long so they had enough time for the children to get educated and so on. I try to, to draw a line between her and Grumpy because it's, it's, they are very close together, but Gramsci in different from Osa Luxemburg thought that you have to educate the masses in, a, in, a, in another way. He didn't think that they were already ready to take over power, to govern, to do all these things that Luxembourg thinks they should if they were only given these experiments into their hands. And she, she, she gave them the bourgeois culture. But Gramsci invented, how do you call it? Do you could could I suppose that everybody knows Gramsci? For example, he has something like a personality theory, mm -hmm. where he says that all these people are uh, connect. They are um, they have their past and carry their past with them from very different roots and different traditions and different ideas, and they don't put them together in a coherent way. Mm -hmm. So this keeps them from really being able to take over, like Luxembourg wants them to, to take over, to govern, to take over the power, because with one end they are reactionary, another they are in a fascist tradition, in another part they are just revolutionary. They are already people of the coming generation of science and so on. Mm -hmm. So they are they are put together and didn't didn't uh, was heißt inventar vorbehalt. Peter, was heißt ohne inventar vorbehalt? Um. <laughs> they have inherited. Uh, yeah, inher oh, yeah, yeah. It, it's more like accumulated knowledge, accumulated knowledge over time, like a, a sediments of knowledge, intellectual sediment, intellectual sediment. Yeah, they have inherited lots of contradictory things that keeps them from being able to act. They don't. They have to fight and put them together. So, but Luxembourg thought it would be enough to let them read the bourgeois culture, appropriate the bourgeois culture, and then with their heart as workers and coming from their experience as being at work, this would be enough for them. So there is, there really is a sort of overestimation or underestimation of the power of, of past and and reactionary societies to the hearts of and heads of the people and that you need a different politics in addition to this. So if you really compare Gramsci's politics, cultural politics and hers, you can see that somehow she, she didn't overestimate the masses as a bourgeois legend tells us, but she thought it would not be of such enduring influence. They could just strip it off and become this wonderful people of the future. And as soon as they have the ruling, they have overcome the ruling class, they can rule themselves without this long process of become different persons. So it's really a, a, a big task to work with Luxembourg and with Gramsci at the same time, which we think, I think we should do. Quite fascinating. Thank you very much. Uh, there's another question from the chat. Uh, it's, a, it's a big one. It says, uh, please explain the next step for women's freedom in the third world countries in Rosa's view. In, in uh, third world countries? Yes, on the developed world, uh, developing world, third world countries. What's the next step for freedom in third world countries based on a Luxembourg perspective? 
I think it's it's trying to ask what should be done for the freedom movements in the, de no, in the it's, developing it's world. It's almost like like what can we do to <laughs> what what is missing before all of us <laughs> take over the whole world? It's, <laughs> it's there are so many things to be done in different countries. The countries are different. You can see, for example, the um, the example of Chile. It was such a wonderful. <laughs> almost, almost stepping to socialist ruling mm -hmm. uh, after the, after Allende or in the course of Allende and what it's now, it's, it's awful. It's in the beginning of wars and violence, especially on women. So what can they do? What are we going to do? I, I once went, I was invited to Australia and so there I introduced memory work. Everybody was very enthusiastic and they even had a chair now for memory work. And so I also traveled to the north of Australia, to the indigenous people and started trying to tell them about memory work. It was absolutely hopeless because memory work presupposes a, a subject and they were not educated in being subjects themselves, but daughters or n nephews, fathers in third generations, but they didn't, they had no eye, they had no bourgeois eye, which could be put together in this Gramscian way of being bizarre put mm -hmm. together and which we then could work with to get, to get <laughs> to get a better idea of the world because there were no subjects so we had to start even earlier and so if we go to the underdeveloped countries where do we going to start we as intellectuals always start with education we go and come into this country, see how is the situation for the next generation, for women, for workers, and how can we educate them to take their fate into their own hands. But really this already presupposes the bourgeois subject. And it's awful to do this all in one question let's start in let's start in one country and try and try it in our country for example i had i for for a long time i was always teaching in austria in austria not always in australia this was only one term in austria lots of times and i thought oh that's wonderful i have almost convinced whole austria it's it's so it's so comely i can see, i have it in my hands everybody is already thinking in in the leftist way taking her and his fate into their own hands and now they can govern their state and it's almost it's almost ready so go back go back to germany it's more difficult we have the east and the west and different so it's difficult but austria is easy and then one year later the absolutely reactionary right one in austria so the majority of austria was far far from <laughs> from Germany. <laughs> so the, the question is too big. Maybe we better start asking everybody what's your what had you what did you learn? What's your specialty? What can you contribute to the world in the whole? So where do you want to go? What's the problem in this country? And which is which are their failures? Their prob where do they need you? And then you can answer the question. Thank you very much. Okay, a uh, couple of more questions are in, so let's keep them coming. There is a question that says, a fascinating discussion. I would love to know if there are texts of Gramsci and Luxembourg in conversation in some way with each other. As far as I know, there is actually uh, recently uh, the, somebody wrote a text, if I'm not mistaken, for historical materialism journal, 
and uh, I think that uh, it's quite in the line what Frigga was discussing, but as I know, they weren't actually in conversation uh, conversation uh, directly, but Frigga, maybe, maybe you can say um, something more concretely. Um, um, as I know, it's not an explored, uh, well enough explored subject, but definitely I know one text, which is, uh, I can Google it in the moment and, and find the reference. But Ankika, I wrote a text called the Leide Ruxen, Luxembourg Gramsci, and it's in the Historical Critical Dictionary of Marxism. It was fought at in the beginning. Nobody believed in this being a real good keyword and entry. But in the end, everybody was convinced. And I, I still think it's a very good introduction to for both different ideas and policy making and theory and at the same time see how it matches and where it dis where they part from each other and which one answers on which and so it's it's really since I had so many animals it's really very coherent and and recommendable it's in it's in English and Spanish no, it's in German. Eh, no, it's in English as well. Yes, yes, in English. Mm -hmm. It's English, German, mm -hmm. and Spanish, so many can read it. Thank you. Uh, just if I could add a word on this, uh, there is a, a one place in the prison notebooks where Gramsci discusses Luxembourg, and it's a uh, he issues a, a critic a critique. He reads her mass strike pamphlet as uh, deterministic. Uh, that is, when conditions get uh, progressively worse, the masses will kind of automatically respond. It was a rather narrow reading of the mass strike pamphlet. Uh, it's a passing comment that he makes about Luxembourg, and it probably was from the general discussion that was occurring in the communist movement of the time that when he went into prison in 26, where now the criticism of Luxembourg was, of course, becoming very predominant. They were trying to push out her legacy, the common turn from the, from the, from the, from the, from the communist movement, and one of the ways they tried to do so was to say that she was an economic determinist and therefore was not making room for uh, the uh, role of the party as what would be needed to lead the masses to victory, which is, of course, a myth. Uh, but I'm not saying Gramsci bought that completely, but there was a, at least an element of that in her criticism of Luxembourg's uh, political writings. But you have to remember that he didn't have access to much of her work. Uh, and uh, at, at the time that he went into prison. And she would not have had access to, I don't believe, uh, any of his, uh, because of course she goes into prison in 1915 and she's not released until shortly, right after the German revolution in 1918. One of the things that's ironic is she was very interested in the Italian socialist movement and kept up relations with them. She did write a letter to a, somebody who Gramsci knew very well, who was a former comrade of his, uh, in October 1914, she writes a letter to Benito Mussolini when he was still on the left wing of the Socialist Party <laughs> and uh, uh, telling him, uh, giving him suggestions as to how to organize an anti-war faction within the so Italian Socialist Party. It was very shortly after that, that Mussolini suddenly made this turn to national chauvinism and to the far right. Um, people forget often that Mussolini started out as an internationalist and a, and a leftist. So, um, but I don't know of any other connections other than that. But thank you very much. Okay, we're gonna to have to be wrapping up pretty soon, unless anybody else went to, was that a, okay. Uh, there is a question here, um, uh, which is another rather broad one, but is how can we use technology to teach the masses if they can't find the time to read or if they're not literate? So what's the role of technology in this? I go away for one minute. Okay, fine. Peter, one That's minute. That's okay, That's fine. Okay, what to say? Well, uh, probably uh, technology to the people, the question of infrastructure in, 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 in contemporary times, and especially in terms of available uh, internet, I think, if you speak about uh, technology that might be useful in terms of uh, education, especially 
online education or something like that, which brings me again to a very similar question about technology and the emancipation of women, which is quite similar to that, I think, but uh, it doesn't uh, just uh, self-understandingly reflects the question. But yes, I think there are many different ways in which can we can use technology in a progressive way. Uh, but I say it's probably the question uh, of um, the infrastructure, the question of availability, uh, the question, the, the class question. And I think that before we think in the terms of technology, I think we have to think about uh, um, uh, about the uh, education and the literacy, which is still a huge problem uh, if we bear in mind that um, a huge majority of women in the world is still illiteral. So how can we speak about uh, you know, technology not taking into account the basic fact that people are still not, uh, um, or many people are still not able, uh, able to read. Um, but yes, uh, uh, the, the question says the masses to hear if they can find the time to read. So I think that one of the, the, the socialist question is definitely to arrange more time. So this is a huge question in terms of the critique of capitalism and how it functions. What is the free time? What is the productivity and how to organize ourselves to work less in order for many masses to have more, not just in terms of wealth, but in terms of information, of course. Okay, well, thank you very, very much for those responses. Uh, this has been a terrific panel. Thank you all very much for the, for the presenters and thank you the audience very much. I will give Friga and uh, Ankicha just a, a minute if you wanted to say any final words uh, before we, we depart. Uh, but I just wanted to personally thank both of you, especially for the, not just what you've done here in this panel, but for the great work reaching back so many years. Thank you, Peter. Thank, thank everybody, Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung and International uh, Rosa Luxemburg Society and many fantastic questions. Uh, I think this debate will probably be ongoing, uh, not just today, but even tomorrow. Many questions we open today, especially in terms of the accumulation of capital, colonialism will be discussed more in some other panels. But yes, I will leave the floor, uh, the microphone uh, to figure how Yes, thank you very much as well. Um, I would like to begin right now because I, I just think we are warm enough and have run long enough <laughs> to now start on some <laughs> on differences and, and what we all agree and which is for sure easy to agree with and where we want to go on and where our remaining questions are is how to use those different socialist theories in this world of commodities now where I'm, I'm very much astonished if I discuss with the next generation, over next generation, the generation of my grandson. Yes, it's already the generation of my grandson what sort of problems they discuss and how you have to overbridge this. I would have liked to know the age of those who have asked questions to see where they come from and what necessary bridges have to be built because I, I love teaching and I love being together with the next and over next generation and discuss with them and see what I agree that they have no time to read or that they're just always sitting at their handies and um, exchanging meaningless sentences. For example, I always had my grandson with me in all conferences and because I couldn't travel on my own any longer. So he came with me and he was always sitting there with, with great, great uh, with group big eyes and saying, oh, I understood everything now. Now I have understood this. I, I really want to study as well. And where do I study and what with what begin? And now he's he's asking me, can I help translating the best texts and which are the ones because he's very good in languages. And he, say, he wants advice and 
I, I, I don't know this generation, but I would disagree that they don't have time to read or don't want to read or so. Mm -hmm. Depends on the culture they are in. For example, this grandson of mine always comes with at least a gang of youth, six or seven, discussing world problems and how to enter them and what they can do and so on. So there's a whole field for all of us to go on. Go Thank you on very much. Our work. Thank you very much. And just I want to close by mentioning in terms of going on with our work and making work available, including work of Rosa Luxemburg, uh, there is a project underway uh, to publish the complete works of Rosa Luxemburg. Uh, three volumes have been published in English. Uh, it's a projected 17 or 18 volume series that Verso Books in London and New York is publishing. If anybody wants to help out in the project of, of making that translations possible to publish everything Luxembourg ever wrote in English translation uh, for international circulation, you might want to visit the Toledo Translation Fund. Toledo Translation Fund, if you type into a search engine, Toledo Translation Fund Rosa Luxembourg, uh, that's where you can make a donation if you so wish uh, to help cover the course of uh, this ongoing project, which is going to consume us for quite a number of years to make everything available that Luxembourg wrote, uh, whether economic writings, political writings, correspondence, et cetera, much, most of which has not yet appeared in English, so about at least three quarters of her actual body of writing. So I want to thank again, everybody, for a very uh, exciting panel, and I uh, hope you uh, will stay uh, tuned to the rest of the conference, because we have a lot of other interesting panels coming up uh, the rest of today and tomorrow. So uh, thank you all very much.